Stanford University. Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, session of State of the Union. Uh, our announced uh, subject for this evening is the environment, but as you will shortly learn, the composition of this panel, as well as just a moment's reflection, reminds us that there is a very tight connection between issues concerning the environment and issues concerning energy. And indeed, those two coupled issues of environment and energy, I think, also sit at a kind of nexus of science, policy, and politics. And I think all of those elements will come into tonight's discussion. So I'd like to begin with just a few more or less scientific facts, about, uh, especially about energy. And then I'd like to say a few things about the institutional and political regimes that we in this state and this country and indeed around the world uh, have uh, ginned up and put in place by way of trying to address energy and environment issues. So first, just some basic uh, facts, and I stand ready to be corrected by Secretary Chu if I muff any of this, but I think it's reasonably accurate. Uh, in the United States, uh, the sources of energy production break down nationally as 25% from petroleum, 22% from coal, 22% from natural gas, which is rising actually, about 8.5% from nuclear, and about 8% from other sustainable renewable sources, of which the major one is hydropower. As for the consumption of energy by sector, electrical power generation accounts for 40% of energy consumption, transportation 29%, and industrial use 21%, and residential and commercial use only 10%, which actually strikes me as something analogous to something that was discussed across the campus just the other day. <clears throat> there was a day-long forum on water policy, and one of the facts that was adduced in that discussion is that in the Western United States, where water is such an urgent issue, 80% of engineered or managed water goes to agriculture, and only 20% to urban and industrial use. So in both the energy and the water sectors, when we ring our knickers about saving water or electricity at home, we're actually chipping away at only a minor fraction of the bigger picture of energy consumption. Uh, nationwide, this country is the second largest consumer of energy on the planet. You can guess what number one is. And on a per capita basis, we do a little better. We're the seventh largest consumer on a per capita basis. And per capita consumption has actually been flat for quite a long time, three or four decades. Now in this general picture, to bring it back out here to the west and to California, there are significant regional variations. So if we look just at electricity generation, California gets 52% of its electricity, the things that are illuminating this room tonight from natural gas, 16% from nuclear, 16% from hydro, and only 1% from coal, although nationwide we get 22% of our energy from coal. The state of Oregon gets 44% of its energy, electricity, electrical energy from hydro generation. The state of Washington gets 70%. And the province of British Columbia gets 86% of its electricity from hydro. Now I call out these four jurisdictions, California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia in particular, because they have tried now not once but twice in 2008 and again in 2013 to come up with a regional energy plan. The current plan is called the Pacific Coast Action Plan on Climate and Energy to introduce a cap and trade and other energy sharing and co conservation sharing measures across this region. And this is not a trivial region. The combined GDP of British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California is $2.8 trillion. If this were an independent country, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. So progress we make in this region on these kinds of issues is telling in its own right and also exemplary for the rest of the world. So this leads me to a little, a last reflection just to get us started on the institutional and political uh, jurisdictions and apparatuses we've put in place to try to manage environmental and energy issues. And I just had this bright idea to look into this early this morning. So this is fresh off my computer screen. Uh, but it was actually surprising to me to see the variation in political and uh, institutional arrangements that exist to address these matters. So, for example, 
At the federal level in the United States, we have a Department of Energy, former Secretary of Energy Steve Chu is with us tonight. And we also have an Environmental Protection Agency. They are two distinct and discrete entities. Uh, the the uh, Secretary of Energy is a cabinet member. The, uh, the director of the Environmental Protection Agency is not a cabinet member, but has cabinet status. And both of these institutions, incidentally, or maybe not so in incidentally, are relatively young. Both of them created in the 1970s. Uh, the Energy Department in the Carter administration and the Environmental Protection Agency in the Nixon administration. In the United Kingdom, a society we often compare ourselves to, there are ministries of, on the one hand, energy and climate. That's the formal title of that cabinet ministry. And then there's a separate ministry for environment, food, and rural affairs. So the Brits have clearly framed their energy and environment issues institutionally much differently than we have. In Canada, there are ministries of the environment on the one hand and natural resources on the other, but no cabinet level Department of Energy. In Australia, there's also no energy department, but there is a Department of Environment and Water Resources. Germany has a Ministry of Energy and, and Economic Affairs, another interesting framing. And then there's a separate ministry in Germany for Environment, Nature, converse, Conservation, Building, and Nuclear Safety. France, of course, has many, many ministries. And they've lumped a lot of things into one ministry of ecology, sustainable development, transportation, and energy. China has no ministry of energy, but it does have a ministry of environmental protection and a ministry of water resources, two distinct enterprises. So these are, uh, to me, rather suggestive of the varieties of ways that people around the planet have tried to cope with these matters. And our institutional arrangements may or may not be optimal. They're certainly peculiar to our distinctive political culture. Well, to discuss these issues tonight, we have people with deep expertise in all the component elements of this nexus of science, politics, and policy. Uh, we have with us Stephen Chu. Uh, to say of Steve that his career has been distinguished uh, would not do justice to his career, and we would immediately start looking for a superior word to distinguish to describe it. Uh, Steve was born and raised in St. Louis. Uh, sorry about those cards, Steve. <laughs> he attended the University of Rochester, took his PhD in physics at UC Berkeley, worked for a time at Bell Labs, where he did the work that later won him the Nobel Prize, came to Stanford in 1987, a decade later was awarded the Nobel Prize, for what I understand as developing techniques for isolating single atoms with laser tweezers. Now, as I say, as I understand it, because I still have reasonably fresh in my memory an evening some now nearly 15 years ago after Steve had won the Nobel Prize and I found myself sitting next to him at dinner and asked him to describe in terms that I could understand what he'd done to get the Nobel Prize. And as best as I can remember, Steve, you did use the word tweezers. And that made it concrete for me, and that's how I've understood it ever since. <laughs> 2004, he left Stanford briefly to uh, run the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, served as Secretary of Energy from 2009 to 2013, and has now returned to Stanford. Steve, welcome home and welcome here tonight. Uh, our other guest tonight. is Tom Steyer, who has a no less distinguished but somewhat less lengthy resume, but then he's 10 years younger than Secretary Chu, Professor Chu, so he's still a promising young man with lots to come. <laughs> Steve, uh, Tom was a Yale undergraduate and a graduate of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He founded Farallon Capital, which he left in 2012 to become a very prominent and active participant in the political arena on behalf of alternative energy, particularly through his uh, organization, NextGen, about which we will probably have some conversation here this evening. Tom and NextGen have played roles in defeating Prop 23 a few years back here in California and in passing Prop 39. And as those of you who read the newspapers will know, 
Uh, Tom has actively been actively involved in political races in Virginia, Massachusetts, and most recently in Florida, as described in an article in yesterday or Sunday's New York Times Magazine. Uh, with his wife, Kat Taylor, uh, they have helped to found the Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy at Stanford. Tom is also a Stanford trustee, where I believe he was instrumental in the recent decision by the Board of Trustees to undertake divestment of uh, investments in uh, coal-related industries. So Tom, welcome to you as well. Uh, And Steve, if you would like to get us started, please, uh, with an opening statement and then uh, followed by Tom. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm not going to go into what I got the Nobel Prize for. I, have to, <laughs> I need another dinner with Tom. David. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to briefly mention uh, what we know about some of the science. And, and let me preface this by saying that the science is taken us as a world society in a place we have actually never been before. Uh, because the science is saying that what we are doing today, what we've done in the last 50 and 100 years, and what we will do in the next decades, uh, will have a big impact on future generations, not 10 years, but 50, 100, 200, 300 years from today. We as a society never had to face that issue. And, and so let me, let me start by saying uh, that uh, I think most people, even quote climate skeptics, um, uh, recognize that the weather has been changing over the last three, four decades. Uh, this is demonstrated it's changing. Now the, the next issue is, is it due to humans or is this of natural variability? And there has been over the last several decades more and more compelling evidence that no, a large fraction of this appears to be due to humans. Now, what happens in the future has large uncertainties. If you ask any serious scientists who have been following this, it, you know, depending on what we do in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, even if we knew what that was, there's large uncertainties. A mild thing, if we, let's say, go to 550 parts per million carbon dioxide equivalent, is a low ball estimate would be maybe you're a couple of degrees land average hotter, Fahrenheit. Otherwise, a high ball estimate, you can go over six, seven degrees Fahrenheit. Actually, I'm, well, I'm going to put in centigrade because I think in centigrade, I'm sorry for. <laughs> but um, let me put it in terms of probabilities of what happens if we're at some level. If, if there's um, something where the temperature increases by five or six degrees, you have to look back at the ice ages, that was a time five or six degrees colder. Doesn't sound like much, but all of Canada, the United States, the mid, mid United States, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and above covered year round in glacier. So five degrees, six degrees has a profound impact on, on what the world was like then, and going five degrees the other way has an equally profound impact. What's the chance of that happening? We don't really know, there, but it is within, it, is it 20%? It could be, it could be 30%. Is it 90%? Well, it depends on what we do uh, in, the, in the coming decades. Uh, but, but if you think about such a different world and even having a 20% chance or 30% chance is a very, very scary proposition if people think about it, but people don't think about it. And I'll just close by uh, having an analogy, um, there's an epidemiology of what's happening in the changing weather patterns. And uh, I liken it to the epidemiology in the 60s and 70s having to do with cigarette smoking. And in those days, it was becoming more apparent to the medical community that the incidence of lung cancer among young male adults has risen above the noise. Certainly began to do that in the 50s. By mid-1960s, the average consumption of adult males in the United States was 220 packs a day, including the non-smokers. 220, sorry, packs a year, in, <laughs> <laughs> including the non-smokers, okay? And, and uh, what we know today, and so in those days, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the waters were muddy. Uh, how do you know 
you know, causation does not mean, correlation does not mean causation. The medical community can't predict who's going to get lung cancer, who's not. And maybe in 30 years, we'll have this figured out, and it'll be curable. And oh, by the way, it's OK, because we're not, we don't know for sure who will get sick and who will not. Sound familiar? Um, except there's one big difference. Uh, the time lag for cigarette smoking and cancer was about 25 years. The time lag, we don't even know. It could be 25, it could be 50, it could be 100 years from what we've already done today. But it's more serious. We smoke, and our children and grandchildren get lung cancer. So I say, what's the problem? I enjoy. <laughs> and, and this is what society has to face, this intergenerational thing, which we never had to face before. We, what we do today will affect our children and grandchildren and their generation, and actually for about a millennia. And so this is what we have to grapple with. We've never had to face this before in the history of society. Uh, again, the uncertainties are quite large, but it, there are very real risks. I'm not talking about a 1% or 5%. I'm talking about 50 higher percentage. It could be 80. I don't know. Okay, And that's the dilemma we're here to talk about today. Um, Thank you. Um, so I think to rephrase what Steve Chu just said, this is what we would think of as the generational challenge for Americans now and for people actually around the globe right now. That, and I don't think it's unusual in American society for there to be an issue which is the measure of how a generation does. If you think back through your own family, if I think back through Jim's and my family, what our parents went through, what our grandparents went through, there was an issue where you really had to be on the right side and that a generation had to uh, make sacrifices for, had to really think through and decide it was important to them. And in American society, we've always met those challenges. And as a result, the people in my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation felt very proud of what they'd done. And they, you know, they look back through the world wars, they look back to the civil rights issue, they look back through the success of American society on a host of issues where they had felt like that was their challenge and their peers' challenge. So when we think about this challenge, you can't listen to Steve Chu and think that what we really have is a bunch of scientific research to do to decide if this is a problem. And that it's also true that it isn't that tough a policy question. You know, the United States has dealt with pollution in several forms very successfully. Oddly enough, we've done it almost exclusively in Republican administrations. The Nixon administration, the Reagan administration, the George H.W. Bush administration all had, all passed extremely important legislation dealing with pollution. In fact, what we're dealing, the way that we're dealing right now with energy and climate issues is predominantly through legislation, the Clean Air Act, the e that was passed in the Nixon administration. So it really isn't about our ability to come up with arcane policy solutions. It's actually a political question. Up until now, it, elected officials around the country have not felt as if it was their, in their interest to deal with this aggressively. And as a result, in spite of the fact that about two-thirds of Americans believe this to be a problem and actually would agree with the kind of solutions that uh, climate scientists or climate policymakers might believe in as well, we haven't really gotten a lot of action, particularly at the congressional level. So the question is, what is going to change that? Well, in fact, if you look in 2014, this is changing. You know, over the last five months, I've done a reasonable amount of traveling around to different states where there are elections going on in, on November 4th of this year and talked to people and seen American citizens dealing with this. And I think that the salience, the importance with which people are dealing on the ground this year with energy and climate issues is significantly different than any time in the past. I think that they are dealing, that as an electoral issue, it is much more of a wedge issue or a, the kind of issue that's make or break for politicians than it's ever been and people are having to address it. So that when we think about this, you know, our means 
American means of social change is democracy. <coughs> that is what we do in order to, when we need to have a transition, that is how we do it in a, in a very old fashioned way and in a very powerful way. And I think that's what's going on right now in 2014. I think it's gonna continue after 2014. But I think that we're on the path to dealing with this intergener intergenerational issue that Steve Chu was describing and that American democracy can be our way, that's the way we've traditionally dealt with threats to our society, and I believe that's the way we'll deal with this threat. Thanks. So let's kick conversation off with just a bit more of the, the science of, of climate change. And, and Steve, I wonder if you could, you know, in addition to the things you said in the opening remarks, perhaps take as a given that the audience is familiar with an inconvenient truth, we, get, we were uh, awakened to the, the problem of climate change, we have a sensibility that uh, there's a, a very, very solid scientific consensus uh, about it. But if you could walk us through perhaps, um, not the probabilities of some of these long-term effects, but rather what you see as um, uh, the kinds of things that science has the strongest consensus about and um, what have we, what kind of thresholds have we passed already uh, that is no longer a matter of speculation? All right, to start with uh, temperature, there's a, since 1850, even 1800, there's been a long-term temperature record um, that has plateaus. We're in a plateau currently, but, but over average over these um, nearly 200 years, um, uh, this is uh, something that's been changing. That's indisputable, it's just a matter of measurements. People have looked at that, whether the data's biased or not, but it's, it, that is just, it's done. Uh, sea level rise, uh, an increasing rate of sea level rise, again, over a 150 year period, that those are things that are just, that's there. That's mar part of the record. The issue is this, we've had very big change swings in climate before. We've had ice ages. We've, going back 20 million years, big changes. So what is different about now? Um, what is different about now is the amount of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide is the most worrisome, has been since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, roughly a nearly 50% increase in the amount of carbon dioxide. So it's not a small effect, it's a big <coughs> effect. Now, as there's, there's no dispute about the greenhouse gas effect. <laughs> uh, there is uh, large uncertainty as to how much the temperature will rise due to this because there are very complicated feedbacks. There are very complicated issues having to do with ocean currents. What people don't realize, but it's very easy to explain, the bottom of the ocean is cold. I spent three or four months, one summer in 2010, trying to help a BP put out an oil spill. Uh, the surface temperature that summer was 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, one mile deep, it was two degrees above freezing all year round. The bottom of the ocean is cold. And so it takes a long time to mix the top surface of the land in the ocean with the bottom. Very subtle ocean currents things. We think, we believe that those are the plateaus. Those are subtle things. Those are not the overall general conservation of energy. If the sunlight energy hitting the Earth is constant, what will happen over a 50-year, 100-year period? Well, if less energy is leaking out, something's going to happen. It's going to go probably in one way over the long term. It's going to warm up. If you eat a cheesecake, an extra slice of cheesecake every night, depending on your metabolism, if you, if you don't exercise more, there's probably one way your weight will go. <laughs> <laughs> How much it goes depends on a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so I think those, the general scope of the general direction and everything is, is conservation of energy. There are things like that. Right. And so it's these more subtle second order effects that we have large uncertainties about. Just one more pass at that. that is, so when, when you used the example before of we're smoking, but it's our grandchildren that are going to pay the price. So it, let, let's assume that the kinds of political changes that Tom Steyer and many others wish to see don't come to pass and the kinds of emissions, we, le emissions levels we see now are, go unchanged or get worse. Do you mean metaphorically, literally, our grandchildren are going to pay some significant price? Or, or are you talking 100, 200 years? No. 
I, I look, in the last 35 years, if you look at the insurance records, and, and the insurance companies are terrified about this, by the way, uh, the <laughs> amount of thunderstorms, hurricanes, floods, uh, things, rain coming at the wrong time, these things have been happening. That's documented. And it's a green ice age documentation of, of what's going on. So, uh, but is this weather or is this climate? Well, if it happens over a half a century, it happens over a century, it becomes climate. So it's rising above the noise. It's, and in my mind, it has risen above the noise. Uh, and we pay for that. That, you know, when uh, Hurricane Sandy, you know, Congress appropriated some $60 billion for Hurricane Sandy. Uh, this, is, this is costly stuff. And the more extreme <coughs> events, the more hurricanes, the more floods, the things of that nature that the climate models predict, as these things happen, we're paying for all this uh, in many, many ways. And the funny thing is, the solution, the technical solutions may become the low cost option, actually, that wind and solar will actually go below natural gas and cost of electricity but there's a muddying of the waters to try to convince people it's not happening, which is fascinating. Okay, uh, wind is within 10% without subsidy as inexpensive as new natural gas. Coal is definitely more expensive than new natural gas and more expensive than wind. So there are these technical things happening, but there's embedded interest to want to, you know, they feel that their existence is existentially threatened. So, Tom, before we talk about the embedded interests, um, uh, what was it that made you a non-Nobel Prize winner last time I checked? Um, go, what scientific stuff moved you the most on this? Because I know when we first started talking about this that you, would, that you would talk on and on, not in the way that Steve just did, about the science. What is it in the science that you think is the most important uh, on issues related to climate and energy? So um, I actually started thinking about this as a result of being a Stanford trustee because I was, Stanford has a reputation and has an ambition to try and do research and solve the biggest problems in the world. And when I became a trustee, I wanted to think about the university's role and think about where it could really have huge impact, where it wasn't already having as much impact as it possibly could. And, that's, and I started to think about what the problems were and, and thought about this one as a result. But I see this problem overwhelmingly in human terms. So that I don't see this, I, I see the costs of this in terms of what it's going to do to people in the United States and people around the world. And so when I think about why this is awful, it is true that all the things that Steve Chu said are true. It's also true that the species are going extinct at a thousand times the rate of what we think of as normal. So we're in a great uh, extinction period as a result of, I think, human behavior. But what, I'm wor what, what wor keeps me up at night is what it's gonna do to the people around the globe. The people in the United States who are exposed to storm surge or rising water. Um, the people around the globe who don't have our kind of resources who are gonna be exposed to those kinds of things. And to a large extent, it's gonna be expressed as water one way or the other. Hurricanes, droughts like the one in California right now, um, and also floods in places in the world where they really can't. They don't have uh, $60 billion to come up with when they have a Hurricane Sandy. So when I think about this, yeah. I think about the most vulnerable, pe vulnerable people in our society. When you think about New Orleans, who really, really suffered as a result of the hurricane in New Orleans, was the most vulnerable people in New Orleans. And when you extrapolate to the whole globe, I can tell you the people who are gonna suffer are not the richest people in the world, they're gonna be the poorest people. Tom, sure. I, I'm sure I'm, I'm not alone when I say that there are probably lots of people in this room very gratified to hear that it was Stanford's mission statement that attracted you to this uh, <laughs> issue. Uh, but uh, how can we leverage what attracted you to the issue and got you uh, engaged with it to the public at large. By, by its very nature, it seems to me, for the reason that uh, Steve Chu mentioned, we smoke now, somebody generations later pays the price. It's very difficult to get the public's attention focused on this issue in a really actionable way. So where, where can, are the points of entry where a public dialogue on this can really get traction? Well, obviously we've spent a lot of time thinking about that question. 
And if you want people to care about what you're thinking about, you have to think about how it affects them. Not, how, n not really what you want to talk about. You have to think about how does this problem impact them today. So when we discuss this and when we think about it, we think about it in very local terms. I can assure you that nobody in the Upper East Side of Manhattan is lying awake worried about the drought in California. And there is nobody here who is worried about the fact that during the king tides, salt water runs down the streets of Miami Beach. It's very local. So when you think about how to bring this to people's attention, you have to bring it to their attention in a local, human way that they care about. And that means you're really talking about the impact on economic activity and jobs, health. I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, but in <coughs> Los Angeles County, 20 to 25% of the kids have asthma, directly related to pollution. So it's jobs in the economy, health. And all, the other thing that Americans respond to very emotionally, very viscerally, viscerally, and very powerfully is the idea that someone is doing something through the political system to disadvantage them and take advantage of them. And those are the three ways that Americans re react to this problem. And you really have to ask yourself in every single instance, locally, on a human level, how does this impact people today? Themselves, their families, the people they love. If you can't do that, this issue can't matter. Steve, what were you going to say uh, earlier when, when, when Tom was talking about his well, well, awakening? Let me, let me pick up a little bit on that, okay. uh, that um, I agree with what Tom said. Uh, but if you look at what's happening in the risks uh, locally in our generation, uh, we were saying, well, is this just a temporary drought? But actually, what's in store for us is the following. Um, as it gets warmer, uh, what's going to happen in the whole western part of the United States, what has been happening over the last couple of decades, three or four decades, is that there are no spring snows. Our water storage system in the western part of the United States has large part to do with the Rockies and Sierra Nevadas. It's snow that has a long melt. But if you have now spring rains instead of spring snows, the dams will not store the energy, the water or the energy, uh, and you have a runoff. So you have flood conditions in late winter, early spring. Uh, that's going to have a profound impact on water use, on agriculture, and the whole western part of the United States. For the last couple of decades, the water tables have been sinking from California, anything west of the Mississippi, deeper, deeper wells. And, and what's in store for us is more spring floods and less stable water supplies, not only in the United States, but uh, China's terrified about this. And now, since they have a bunch of engineers in, in the government, as well as others, uh, they recognize that the northern part of China is under, going to be under severe water stress in the coming decades. Very, very real, that generation, this generation will see that. And so, and you can go geographically on the rest of the parts of the United States, and that's something that's this generation. Uh, this is not a one-off. This drought thing, you know, the land is subsiding over decades. Not over one or two years. David, you remember the opening, your opening remarks here when we were talking about California. You show the water table. I do remember that. <laughs> and, and oh, by the way, we spend about 22% of our electricity in California now moving water. And it goes in one direction, more and more energy to move water. Okay? And it's a vicious cycle. And if you're, and if you're spewing out carbon dioxide to generate the electricity to move the water, guess what? <laughs> water, water weighs about 1,030 tons per acre foot. So the electrical energy to pump it up any uh, elevation is huge, 22%. And, and deeper wells. The, the, the water table in part of the Westlands Water District in the Central Valley, in the eastern part of that district, is one of the most agriculturally productive, rich places on the planet. But the water table, for if they want to access groundwater, is now down 2,000 feet. So the energy cost of getting it to the surface means... Can't do it. And we're actually seeing the freshwater tables now could be partially polluted with saline leakage in our water tables as well. This is a very complicated stuff, but it's not a one-year thing. This has been happening for decades, and that's the scary thing. Most, most Americans, if you're a farmer, you know about this, but I think most average citizens who live in cities or suburbs don't. And are all these interrelated, meaning the concerns you have about carbon dioxide? 
and, and the implications of that, are they also related to the same issues that we're facing in, the, in, in terms of water? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when the climate changes and, and, the, and snows don't happen but rains happen, uh, and, and then in the uh, late spring, summer, when it's hotter and drier, you need more irrigation, but you don't have the water supply for the irrigation. And so there's so the food security, not only in the United States but around the world, is 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 you know beginning to walk down a path. Which I say, look, you know, if you don't watch out, we may end up where we're heading. Tom? Jim, <laughs> I mean, one way, just thinking, one way to think about water in California is there are two phenomena going on. One is that it's getting hotter, so that we get rain when we used to get snow, and also it dries up faster. You know it. Goes in. So one thing is, it, the chance of a hot year has risen a great deal, and at some point the chance of a traditionally hot year will be 100%. Then there was also the chance of having a dry year. So it used to be 50% chance of a hot year, 50% chance of having a dry year. So you had a, you know, a, a low probability of getting a hot, dry year. Well, now our chances of getting a hot year are going up towards 100%. And it's actually Stanford research, people have wondered whether our you know, ex the extreme drought, the fact that we've had the driest 12 months since in recorded time in California over the last 12 months, if that's a fluke, you know, because we've had droughts before for all the people who've lived in California for a long time, we've had droughts before. But it's actually Stanford researchers who have discovered what's called the ridiculously resilient ridge over the Pacific that's breaking up all the storms that would come here. And that is related to the changing climate. So whether, you know, how long that will stay, I certainly don't know, but the fact of the matter is, what we're seeing is two different phenomena, both of them related to climate, that are changing our water patterns here in California. And it's gonna cause us, I mean, I could talk more than you guys wanna hear um, about what that's gonna cause us to do from a policy and political standpoint, but the fact of the matter is, this is something where we're living through the equivalent of superstorm standing. There's something happening to us right now. It just doesn't happen to be something that shows up particularly well on the evening news. It's sort of a slow motion train wreck instead of a two day train wreck. And it, but we're gonna have to deal with it and we're gonna have to figure out what to do about it. All right, well, let, let's shift the conversation then from the science to policy and politics. So maybe it'd be useful uh, just to Imagine a thought experiment. So, Steve, you served some time in D.C. as the secretary um, in the Energy Department. Served some time. That seems a little cruel. <laughs> served some time. time. Had the like privilege of serving time. <laughs> Had the privilege of serving time. Um, I want to come later in the conversation to the issue of whether or not democracy itself is capable of dealing with an intergenerational problem of this sort. So, imagine we lift, we lift democracy. We install an enlightened, enlightened climate dictatorship, climate and you're in charge of setting policy. Uh, you have a completely free reign to do so. Uh, what are the things you do in the first week in, in, your, in your office? I would, I would uh, put it on a long range plan starting that year to say, we're gonna have a price on carbon. It's gonna be slow and steady over the next couple of decades. Send a signal to industry that this is happening. It, that it's just going to happen, and you and you start to make uh, adjustments to that. Uh, that the first thing you do would be the price, the tax I, on carbon. If if I were the emperor of energy, yep. yeah, there we go. That's, a, that's a better title, <laughs> yeah. of not secretary of energy, <laughs> right. not president saying, of the United States. So are would, you saying carbon tax or cap and trade? Uh, I want if it's a cap and trade system, it has to have some bounds, so it's going to increase because because the European cap and trade they gave it too many credits. I would prefer to have a straight tax, quite candidly, and just say it's gonna increase. But you can do it in a cap and trade system, but you better bound it. So, so that you let some market efficiencies work, but you, you, there's a floor, and, and for the next three decades, it's going to increase to, let's say, get it in the range of $50, $60. At that point, all sorts of innovation will have occurred. Okay, and, and that's the amazing thing about the science and technology, if you take it away from the lobbyists and put it into the engineers and scientists, uh, all of a sudden the solutions become much cheaper. Uh, we've seen this in appliance standards, we've seen this in smog catalytic converters, we've seen this in socks and knots. You know, the engineers can figure it out. But as long as there's a chance of stopping it, 
and the lobbyists are there, uh, then, then we're, we're in a different space. So your first is a carbon ta tax of that kind? That's one of the things absolutely positively oh. that there, there's a lot of the EPA things of the local pollution that's a way of closing down this, this, the, the, the grandfathered in old coal plants right. that, don't, that don't even have socks and knock scrubbers, forget particulate matter and mercury, okay, that, that are really inefficient, but the accounting is they've all been paid for, so it's free money. I, I want to hear what Tom has to say about this, but I just want to make sure I understand the point about the tension between the lobbyists and the engineers. Um, is the idea that if you, if you get, rid of the, get rid of the lobbyists, we have this carbon tax that goes into effect, uh, we'll need to funnel much more money to the engineers in order to innovate? Or, no, 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 no. I, I think, uh, again, let me go back to what I see in wind, uh, what I see in solar, what I yeah. see in energy storage. Uh, these are becoming the low cost solutions but as you get to 40, 50, 60% renewables, you need standby backup power. That's part of the cost yeah. of, of this. Uh, can we get there? Yes. Uh, how much extra will it cost? Not much. It, and at the 30, 40, 50% level within a decade, renewables goes cheaper than natural gas, even if natural gas saves at 5 or $6. Five dollars a uh, million BTU. Well, just a point of information: the AB32 target, I think, is 20 percent by 2020. If I got that right, we, that is. Uh, where are we vis-a-vis -vis that goal? Well, we're uh, in California. Uh, I, I think we're going to get to 20 percent. Tom will actually easily. know. Yeah. Uh, it, we'll, it, we're, yeah. We're going to easily surpass yeah. that. The, 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 the trick, the the trick is going above 50 percent. To get to 80 percent is darn hard. And we're not going to just displace more polluting kinds of energy generation to different places. No. It, l let me uh, address Steve's point um, and, and try and put it in a slightly different twist, which is this. Um, we have this great system of capitalism where people sit there and figure out the best way to deliver a service for the cheapest price and compete against each other. And so when we had a very controlled, highly regulated information technology or telephony system with Ma Bell, we had, you know, when Jim's and my parents were around, we had, you know, rotary phones, black and white TVs. That's what my parents had. And we broke up Ma Bell in 1983. We deregulated the telephony system in 1996 and 1998. And there's virtually nothing around today that my parents would recognize. There are no rotary phones. They'd never seen a cell phone. They'd never heard of the internet. They have no idea about the gamification of the web. There is nothing, there's no app that they would recognize. American business took off. And that is not unusual. American business is incredibly creative and innovative. So really what Steve is talking about is how do we harness that and give them a income statement or cash flow statement with all of the costs in it. Because right now, when he's talking about the cost of natural gas versus the, top, the cost of wind or solar, he's not, we're not including in the cost of natural, or natural gas any of the greenhouse gases. So the, the cost of carbon is not in there. So really, when he says what we need to do is put a cost of carbon, what he's saying is, for people who pollute, they should pay for their own pollution. And if they pay for their own pollution and they run their, their income statements, they'll come to the right answer. If you include all of the inputs, then they'll come to the right answer and they'll come up with innovations to keep that cost down. Because who the heck wants to pay extra costs? So they'll spend a lot of time figuring out how to get the cheapest commodity so they can make the most money. And God bless them for doing that. So necessity is the mother of invention and the carbon tax creates the necessity. Yeah, and it gives this long-term signal and then all of a sudden uh, the industry and everybody says, oh, that's where we're going. We're gonna, we're gonna be the most profitable in that long-term signal. And it, it, it's, it is a, it, these things don't happen on a dime. So you guys make this sound so persuasive. Why hasn't it happened? Yeah. <laughs> well, I know who's going to answer that question. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, you know, in this, this is the most partisan issue in the United States of America. So you may think that, you know, women's right to choose is very partisan. You may think that gun control is a very partisan issue. Statistically, this is the most partisan issue in the United States of America. And so if you look at the elections that are going on now, 
try to find um, Republicans running for high elected office who simply acknowledge Steve Chu's opening statement. The climate is changing. It's caused by human, human activity at, you know, to some greater or lesser degree, and it's something we should act on. It's very hard to find that. And so, to a very large extent, there are more climate skeptics in the United States of America than in the rest of the world combined. We, we have a lot of closet believers. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, that that uh, uh, because of the political divide currently, uh, which should not have even been a political question. It's like, is, does cigarette smoking cause cancer? Is that a political question? No. It's a, it's, a, it's a reality scientific question as, as to what's going on. And so, so but going back to uh, this issue, the United States has always had the states lead, the United States. When, when it becomes a federal thing, it's the, almost the last thing to happen. And so what you have is you start with California, followed by New York, Massachusetts, a number of other states, a majority of the states, a majority of the pop, two thirds of the population live in states that have renewable portfolio standards, all this stuff. Uh, so California started in appliance efficiency standard regulations. It took a while for the federal regulations to say, we, this is gonna help Americans save money, period. Uh, right, it's not the big hand, evil hand of government. So, so that will happen. China will put a price on carbon, I think, within this Chinese government. They, they come in 10-year blocks. They're, in the, they're third, going into the third year. Within the next eight years, I think China will put a price on carbon in China without a UN agreement, without anything. They're going to do this because they really, the risks of climate change to China are immense. Okay? And that's going to help the United States. Sadly, I think the United States will come after China even though that's a very sad statement. <laughs> uh, but California has led, and it will continue to lead, and other states are, 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 are coming along. So two, two, two questions. <laughs> so first, um, that is the carbon tax, or some version thereof, the absolutely most important policy priority? And, and, and as a follow-on, what would be the second most important? Because it isn't just a carbon tax. So you're going to do that, but what else? I mean, not everything's going to change. I mean, a lot might change from that. And the second one is on this is the states versus the federal government piece. Um, by the way, I will say this. I was with your former colleague, Arnie Duncan, yesterday talking about early childhood, right, who basically said the exact same thing. My brother and I fight about this all the time. What's the most important issue facing our country? Um, I personally believe it's the failure to invest in kids in education. And Arne Duncan said the same thing. There are a ton of closet believers on early childhood, but they will not vote for it for different reasons, but the same thing. If I get them in a room and have the conversation privately, they will acknowledge completely it's a no-brainer and it's an absolute imperative for us to invest in a society. But if I get them out front, they will vote against it, they will go on TV, and make a political statement about it, and nothing will happen. That's essentially what you're saying in terms of the, the clause of believers. My question is, if, that, if the states matter, is it true that there are a handful of states that are basically screwing it up for the rest of us? It, no, that's really the question you should ask as a citizen. Are there a few ridiculously retrograde states, I don't know the answer to this, who are, because of their antiquated economic structures and the political power structures, essentially screwing it up for everybody else when it comes to carbon. And then the second question was what I started with is, what else do you do other than the carbon tax? So, yeah, well, so the state question first, that's, is that what goes well, on politically? All, I think we should take a moment uh, to acknowledge the fact that, as Steve said, California is the worldwide leader on this. Yeah. We have the most progressive energy laws of any major government in the world, we have a price on carbon. We have, we use half as much energy per capita as the rest of the United States, which is good, but not, you know, we could definitely do a lot, lot better. Um, and when you think about states, we are trying hard to, as Steve said, link up with Oregon, Washington, right. and British Columbia, at the same time that there is a carbon market in, with nine northeastern states. But when you think about this problem and you think about the relationship of states to each other and the, then the United States of America, this is a global problem. So the issue here is even if the United States did a terrific job, 
If the rest of the world ignored us and went about their business, which is not going to, for a whole bunch of reasons, that's not the situation we're in. But if that were true, then what we did would not be sufficient. It is necessary in this that there be leadership in the world, including leadership from the United States of America. This is not happening without, it's, we will not do this by ourselves, but I do not believe this is possible given our wealth, given our technolo technological advantage, and the fact that people still believe that we try and do the right thing. When you look around the world, there are, it is very hard to find a country that has the credibility that we have after all of our issues where people really believe that we can stand up and do the right thing. So it is, hard, it is impossible for me to believe that the world will solve this problem without major leadership from the United States of America, not by ourselves, but holding hands with other major countries and saying this has to happen and we're going to make it possible. We're going to help other countries come along. We're going to give them technology. We're going to finance things so that the two billion people who don't really have any kind of significant energy use are going to come into the modern world. You know, if you look, one of the things to remember about energy, if you look at GDP growth per capita around the world, it is incredibly tightly linked with energy usage. Go back to 1800 in any country and look at GDP growth and energy use. And they look, they are absolutely, they follow each other exactly. So there are two billion people right now who basically don't use very much energy at all and who have a significant ambition to do so. I, I want to make one small correction to that. That is absolutely true in developing countries. Energy and uh, energy well, use right. and GDP. But we've gotten but, to a point where it's yes. diverged. If you look at yeah. Japan, Denmark, Europe compared to the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, the, the prosperity of the country as measured by not only GDP per capita, but also healthcare and yeah. education per capita, it absolutely becomes flat. Okay, that you can't say the people of Denmark have a lower standard of living than we do per capita. They, they we're about the same. Japan uses one third as much energy, Denmark half as much energy. They want to go cut in half, and we're out there because why? Well, because energy in the United States for over 100 years was really inexpensive. And it didn't matter. We were blessed with incredible energy, coal, oil, gas, you name it. And so, so, but there's this 800,000 pound gorilla stalking in the room now that's changing that. But can you guys <laughs> answer the states, this US states question that I asked? Is it that there's a small number of states in the US that are really the problem here domestically? We have a political system which gives, in the Senate where you need a super majority of 60 votes, uh, two votes per state. And so when you can have the majority of Americans living in the popular states moving in the right direction, but you have that political system, which we will have for the next 100 years, <laughs> I think, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, two Senate votes per, and, and probably no, at least in the near term, uh, end of the supermajority is 60%. That means that it's designed to maintain status quo most, rather than where the majority of Americans, what they want. And so it's, it's not a few states, it's that supermajority and the two votes in the Senate that really matter. But, but, but to this point, and I, I don't want to throw cold <laughs> water on your championing California leadership because I salute it as you do, but uh, the Pacific Coast Compact on Climate and Energy that I mentioned, its first iteration, 2008, it had about eight or nine states and I think three Canadian provinces. It collapsed, all the interior states withdrew. So what we have now is also not a very robust organization, frankly, but it's only the three coastal states in British Columbia. So even that amount of regional cooperation amongst a relatively small number of players turned out to be really difficult. So how, how, do, you, how do you get a bigger apparatus in place to handle yeah, this? I agree. Well, if, so 2008. In 2008, both presidential candidates in the United States of America were running on acknowledgement of climate change and a need to act on it. I think that uh, both John McCain and Barack Obama talked about it openly, and the partisan aspect of this hadn't happened. It was really subsequent, it was really as a result, I think, of a bunch of things, but including the energy bill in 2009, 2010, where it really, people took sides on a very, in a very partisan way, and we've really never come back from it. I think we are, so the idea that states would withdraw signaled that there was a huge political change 
in with regards to this issue in the United States, a huge bifurcation. And it's really now that we're coming to grip with the meaning of that. And, ki and in my mind, having the dialogue publicly that is democracy to say, not are we right, not what's the truth, but is this important enough for us to act on? This is really a question about, do Americans care enough about this to make their elected officials make a change? So let me just give you one example. 92% of Americans want background checks on guns. 92%. 70% of NRA members want background checks on guns. And as we all know, we do not have background checks on guns, and they're very far from happening. So when you think about poll numbers, poll numbers are not what determines what happens in terms of legislation. Because the 8% who do not want background checks on guns vote on that issue. So it's really a question not of what is people's opinion, it's how do they vote. The power of American democracy is not your opinion, it is how do you vote and will you change your vote if someone doesn't do the right thing on this issue. And that's the, that is the power of American democracy and unless it reaches that level of importance to you, your opinion is not as important as you would hope. Yeah, I, I would second that. It, 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 for the, 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 uh, the people who don't want the background checks, it is a litmus test vote. And it's, it's amazing because it didn't even get to the Senate floor for a vote. Okay. It, it was that skewed. And, you know, when, when uh, the thing happened in, in like this new Massachusetts, you know, it, it was with uh, the vice president's chief of staff, and he asked me, well, what do you think we should do? I said, well, look, assault, forget about banning assault rifles. I would say two things. Uh, background checks on guns, including gun shows, and go from a 30 magazine clip to a 10 magazine clip, you know, because no hunter would say, I really need 30 bullets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you need more time in the target range. And, 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 and uh, none of those things even got to uh, a, a vote uh, anywhere. It just didn't get close. And that was, and what a low bar, given most, the vast majority of Americans what they thought. Because it became the litmus test and that was it. And in, in those swing states where, you know, fear, fear of uh, uh, violating the second golden rule of American politics, which is get reelected. All right, so this, <laughs> well, you're reminding us of a characteristic of our political system that our Stanford colleague, Francis Fukuyama, calls the vetoocracy, that there are just so many veto places in the system that it makes it very difficult to get something done. So where do you think, it, it, to the extent that's an accurate description of our political culture and system, where are the big vetoes, where are the big blockers that are impeding uh, positive progress on climate and energy issues? Well, is, it, a, is it just a handful of recalcitrant states? No, there's, I mean, obviously there's a gigantic organized opposition to acknowledging, even acknowledging this problem, because I think if we ever just get to the point of acknowledging it, we're going to talk about how to solve it. So I think the point is we, we, we've, we're at a place where there is enormous pressure on elected officials not to acknowledge the problem. And that is, really, you know, there's an enormous amount of money being spent in 2014 on that uh, point. There was an enormous amount of money spent in 2012 on that point. And I think everyone expects there'll be an enormous, even more enormous amount of money spent in 2016 on that point. But, but there's not, this is not a fundamental mystery. I mean, the primary energy, uh, what we spend in primary energy, and by primary energy, I mean coal, gas, coal, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, it, this is an over a trillion dollar a year business in the United States. Uh, so there's a lot of money at stake. Uh, because there's a lot of money at stake and there's a lot of incumbent industries who have established and, and they're making, you know, this is their livelihood. It, think of Phil Boris, uh, it was their livelihood. And so, so you know, coal is, uh, feels an existential threat. Uh, my hope is that oil and natural gas begin to realize that they can transition to energy companies and not follow in the footsteps of coal uh, because we need we need those industries to say, you know, we can put part of this solution. And now, if they're backed into a corner, yep. and and they and 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 they come out with the gloves, we just delay things for decades, and and uh, we lose time and precious, precious time. And and so those are some of the things that are at play now. But it is a a multi-trillion-dollar business. 
And that, so it's no surprise if, if, you, if you feel that your old style of business, doing business is threatened, either, you, you know, what are you going to do? Well, I'm listening to this conversation now and thinking as a person in a political science department, we've heard about the unrepresentative nature of the U.S. Senate, which um, is designed with the supermajority and isn't representative of the population as a whole. California, same number of representatives as, uh, I mean, of senators as Wyoming. Uh, heard about uh, polling numbers um, aren't the way we should think about this, 92% supporting background gun checks, whatever the numbers are on, on, on uh, you know, making some significant change on climate policy. It's intense, intensely organized interests that can, that can get involved in determined policy. Then there's the nature of the incumbent business interests in coal and elsewhere that try to lock into place the existing, existing system that supports um, their financial interest. And upping the ante even further, I think there's a view, certainly um, not uncommon amongst political scientists, for the issues that are intergenerational, as you described them at the start, Steve, that this is, this is going to, we smoke, it brings us pleasure and utility, um, and it's our grandchildren that pay the price. Um, our material interest in the short run is harmed some might say, by adopting all types of um, new changes on climate. And the price is down off in the future, possibly even past our, our deaths. Democracy is designed for short-run solutions, not for long-term long -term solutions. So it's inherent to the nature of democracy that the problem um, might not be solved, and that looking to the democratic system is the wrong way to go in the first place. How do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't disagree more. All it would right. be impossible to disagree more with the statement than the democratic system. I mean, I think if you look at American history, you know, there's the famous Churchill quote, Americans always do the right thing after they try everything else. Huh? <laughs> That's our history. It is, as Steve said, this is a very, it's designed to be a cumbersome system. It's designed to be deliberate and for it to be difficult to pass things so that we don't jump to conclusions. But the fact of the matter is, if you ever get a chance, and I strongly believe that the power we have as citizens is to vote, the power we have is to volunteer, and the power is to get involved. And when you see that system, which I've had a chance to go and see people going door to door around the United States this year, people clipboarding on college campuses, people running phone banks, it is an, there is a reason that we believe so strongly in democracy. It is very powerful. And I think that Americans, you know, I really believe 317 million Americans are together very, very wise. But do, do you not think that democracy is designed more to so solve short-term problems than long-term problems? I understand the concept that a crisis focuses people's minds. But I also believe that when we're talking about this, that's why I said we have to think about how is this an immediate human problem in a local place. So when we talk about it in... Northern California, it's a very different problem. It manifests itself very differently from the way it manifests itself in Southern Florida, from Ohio, from Iowa. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the facts on the ground in 2014, this has become a first tier issue this year. This is absolutely happening this year on the political landscape. And I think this is not something that's gonna be a high point. I think this is gonna be a floor going forward in terms of how seriously people take this. Yeah. But I, I, I would agree with Tom. If first, you know, California, this is our big state, and we're going in absolutely the right direction. You look at uh, Western Europe, and the, you know, between, let's say, in Britain, the conservatives and, and, and the liberal side of the political system, there is no debate about climate change. There is no debate that there's got to be something to be, that has to be done. Okay, and you just go tick down, uh, in your, those are all democratic countries. Uh, and, and there is no debate there. Uh, so, so what is different in Europe versus the United States is because we both blessed with inexpensive energy, we didn't have to face this situation for a long period of time, whereas Europe didn't have that, especially in oil and gas. And the other thing, I mean, Rob, just to, an to answer your question, then I want to ask you guys a question. Look, I, re I remember very well, Tom, the discussions we had. In 2008, remember the point Tom just made. In 2008, both Obama and McCain, whose campaign manager Steve was here a few weeks ago, ran on the issue of climate change and said it was a big deal. So, and then it became, for, there were a variety of factors that happened politically in this country, and you were the energy secretary. But suddenly we went from acknowledging it to overnight stopping to acknowledge it. 
And when we started NextGen, Tom was very, very clear on what the answer was, which was a political answer. Everything he said tonight has been about that, that it was a political answer that you could switch back if, if, if you tried to balance the forces that were on one side, that you could switch back to, to an acknowledgement of climate change as a floor and then go forward. So that's, I mean, so in some ways, Rob, even in a very short-term sense, sure. you can move that back, and that's actually what my brother's been working on doing. But here's the question. If, in fact, you're right that 2014 is a floor, because go look at the races. There's a piece in the Times about it today about how much climate change is actually becoming an issue in key races around the country. You take that out in 2016. How do you, as a, as a scientist and a professor, and Tom Moore as a political officer now, how do you frame these issues to people? Is it still the local issue of health in your, is, is that still the way we're going to do it? Or is it the more broad issue, broad framework of climate change that you've given us? Well, it, it's both. I, okay. look, I, I think, you know, I learned immediately in the first few months uh, in Washington, energy is a local issue in the United States. How people view where they want their energy to come from, what they're willing to accept, what, you know, the change, California, we pay more for our gasoline than just about any other state. Right. Okay, in, right. because we want cleaner air, it means a lot to us. Right. Uh, democracy made that decision within California. Okay, so there's an, another example where, hey, you know, in the end, after exhausting all possibilities, we can make the right decision at the <laughs> federal level. Mm -hmm. But in California, so we, we have these examples where, where this, this is, is happening, and I quite can, I'd rather live in the United States than China. Right. <laughs> for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and, and also the, the uh, democracy plus the capitalism actually is better at finding the eventual good solutions if you give the capitalism a little guidance, a little nudges. I'm a big believer in that. I think, Tom, there's no, you know, the innovation, the, the, the ability of America uh, to innovate once given just, you know, just little few guiding principles. Uh, so it's both the generational stuff that we talked about, yeah. it's the local stuff, it's the water supply, it's, it's the hurricanes and the salt running the streets of Florida, it's all of these things. But, you know, one of the things that's been true when you think about how this gets framed in the United States in a political context is traditionally people who are fighting progressive energy policies, every single time you bring one up, they describe it as a job-killing energy tax. It doesn't matter what you say, that's what they say. But the fact of the matter is, as a result of that, we've done a ton of studies to see if we go down progressive energy uh, policies, as opposed to doing what we're doing now, which of them produces better economic outcomes. So that, they may say that, but they have no studies to back that up. The fact of the matter is, when we do studies, when people you know, distinguish um, academicians go and look at this, it turns out that doing the right thing is also doing the profitable thing. So the first thing that we have to do in terms of changing this dialogue is to say their old claim of job-killing energy tax is something that they assert loudly, but they have absolutely no justification and no research behind. So for instance, I was um, down talking uh, about uh, a, a proposal within the state of uh, California and somebody from the Chamber of Commerce said, you know, claimed that it was going to really hurt the economy. And I said, well, I'd love to see your projections. And he said, don't you have your own projections? And I said, yes, we do have our own projections. But I'd like to see your projections so I can see what, how they're different from ours. And he goes, we have no projections. <laughs> so wh when we run these things, the old way of talking about this which is basically scientific and environmental, is not the thing that people in the United States care about. There is a very, it, it's not the, it, we're not talking to the right people and we're not talking to them in the right way. One of the things that I, I, I feel it incumbent always to bring up, and I'm sure most of you guys know is, the people who care the most about energy, climate, and the environment in the state of California and in the United States are Latinos. The number two group is Asian Americans, the number three group is African Americans. So when we think about who is going to push on this issue, who is going to be the natural coalition that we're going to work with, the idea that we're going to be thinking about what everybody in, this, you know, in the United States thinks are environmentalists is not actually accurate. The people who we're going to be talking to is a much broader group of Americans who look very different 
from the cl cliche <laughs> views of who environmentalists are. Again, I hear, I hear this, and, and so we're not talking about future generations and their interests. I mean, we are in some sense, but, but your view, Tom, is that you, you need to communicate about this issue so that it's you know, a local communication for the issues that people care about here, now, and today. Don't talk about unborn children in the distant future and how they'll be harmed. Talk about how people today are being affected by what's happening um, in the environment, and then make it a local story. And then on top of it, make it a story in which um, when you do the right thing, economically, it turns out to be good for everybody. So I, mean, I'm, I'm, I sort of come back to where David Kennedy said, you know, makes it sound so obvious and simple, but uh, if, if it's about our interests today, not about unborn people in the future, it's about it's economically the right thing to do, what explains the, the unbelievable entrenched interest and, and, and deadlock in policy. We can't even get uh, you know, the, the, the main rival party, the it's, Republican Party, to acknowledge that there is climate change caused by humans. It's the trillion plus dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's money. Yes. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, money does matter. Uh, it, you know, it, it really matters. It, there's, this is a huge swath of money that, and, and, um, and it's to get those sectors of the industry to recognize going forward is, is the right thing to do, okay? And, and let me break it down a little more too, because we're talking about dysfunction in American politics, but we're really talking about only a part of American politics. If you look at the municipal level, what mayors are doing, <coughs> they're close to the ground. There's no mayor sitting here saying, you know, there's salt water running down our streets, let's ignore it. You know, we're in the middle of a terrible drought, let's forget it. The people at the local level, the people at the state level, are compelled to deal with this, at least from the point of view of adaptation. So, you know, I, I know the, in fact, Miami Beach has just spent $350 million on pumps to pump the salt water out of the streets when they have a king tide. So the, there's no question that politicians are reacting to this. It's a different question. We're really focused in this conversation, intentionally or unintentionally, on the U.S. Congress, and we're focused on the U.S. Congress's willingness to deal with the idea of mitigating the problem, not adapting to the problem, since they spent $60 billion on uh, Katrina. It, well, or Katrina. Sa Sandy, Katrina, I mean, these are huge sums, hundreds, tens of billions of dollars per swath, allocations of money, um, lots of insurance comes only partially. There's, this is... Uh, what New York has to do, what New Orleans had to do in order to weatherize after uh, is tens of millions, hundreds of millions to bil billions, billions, tens of billions of dollars you know, to weatherize this lower Manhattan subway system. To, so this is real that's money. That's happening. The question right. is, are we going to be organized to prevent the kind of changes that Steve was describing? Or are we simply going to react to the changes and try and deal with them Syriatum. That's the actual issue we're dealing with, and that's the actual measure, because it seems, if, if you step back, the idea that we're just going to deal with a series of predictable, escalating crises without trying to think about them in a broad scale and think about how to change that pattern seems, you know, completely here, illogical. Here, right. It, it, so what's been happening when we have these hurricanes uh, and increasing flood damage in the East Coast of the United States, is that there's a disaster, the, the federal government steps in and starts to sprinkle tens of billions of dollars. Uh, in Hurricane saying, I know for a fact that the local mayors, they say, okay, we don't want to rebuild exactly the way, you know, maybe you shouldn't rebuild here, or at least as a minimum, put your home on stilts, uh, like home on stilts in the Ninth Ward, but most of the homes were just flat. And, and um, they waive the, um, the laws having to do with the building standards so they could put exactly the low cost option was to rebuild exactly the same, uh, to put the circuit breakers in the basements or in the ground floors of buildings and uh, apartment houses. This is insanity. And, and so then, then the insurance companies say, well, wait a minute, They're, we can't do this. Uh, uh, we have to raise your flood insurance. And so, and the, oh, by the way, most Americans don't realize the national flood insurance is backstops the insurance companies. So when the insurance co companies don't pay, the federal government says, we'll pay, okay? Uh, the debt, uh, and so it becomes part of the national debt. 
and something I learned in Washington, when it becomes part of the national debt, it stays the national debt. The, natu <laughs> the national debt on flood insurance is now over $26 billion that we pay interest on. Now, when we're paying very low interest, it doesn't matter. But as the interest rates go up, this matters. And it's, going, it's just going north. $26 billion interest on national debt going to 30, going to 40, and so on. That's federal government paying for this. This is not in the cost of energy. There's all sorts of things. And, and, and yet, there's not, and the mayor say, I know what to do, but I'm going to get voted out of office if I insist that we build to code. Or who's going to pay, and the homeowners say, who's going to pay for my flood insurance? I'm being forced out of my home or my beach house. A little bit less sympathy for the beach houses. But, <laughs> but, but still, uh, this is going on now. And, um, and, and so then Congress passed the law when I was Secretary of Energy and said, oh, this is going to bankrupt the United States. So we're going to have to pass a law that says uh, that the insurance companies have to raise their rates so it becomes self-sustaining again. Uh, and, they, and they said, well, but, but there's going to be a problem because the rates are going to go way high. So we'll only allow the rates to increase by 25% per year. And, and it was going to start in 2014. I read this bill and said, at the end of 2013, you know what are going to do? They're going to rescind that bill. It was passed in 2011, 2012. And that's what happened. Right? But, and, then, and so who's left with the bill? It's actually the taxpayers that quietly goes on to the national debt because the homeowners say, I can't pay for my insurance and I'm forced out of my home. There's lots of crazy things happening. <laughs> And the mayors know this. You know, I, I met with mayors every year, and we talked about all this stuff. They know this is happening. And it's, it's really goofy. Um, and these are real costs. And so you've got to fold this in. You, know, you can fold a little part of the US Navy into our energy bill, too, <laughs> to keep shipping lanes open, quite candidly. Uh, but there's all sorts of real costs in, in what's going on. And, and if you even fold a fraction of those real costs in, this is a no-brainer in terms of low-cost option. We have it today already. We do. Our, our conversation, quite naturally, it seems to me, has kind of been <laughs> confined within the national boundaries of the United States. We've even devolved it down to municipal boundaries and so on. But th in my view, this is not only an intergenerational problem. Another level of complexity is that it's an international problem. Uh, and we've seen various sputtering efforts on the international stage to come to grips with climate change uh, and global warming, the Kyoto Protocols, the disastrous Copenhagen Climate Summit. I think there's another one scheduled in Paris in the not 2015. Too distant future. <laughs> where, where, where are you talk about leadership, Tom? Where, where are the opportunities for leadership from this country on that, in that international setting? It's been a pretty frustrating record so far. Uh, and we all know that this is a problem that exceeds conventional and rather arbitrary jurisdictional <laughs> boundaries, not only regionally, but globally. So how can we get a purchase on that? Well, first of all, let me say this. And, you know, you should know that there is a D next to my name. So you, if, if that's a problem, you should take that into consideration. But I actually think the Obama administration has done a very, very good jo job on this. They're, they're on top of this problem. They're extremely knowledgeable. They're working within political constraints. <laughs> But they take it incredibly seriously. And I believe that when we look back on the Obama administration, this is one of the places where we'll go. They, were, they did an A job. And I think when they're looking at Paris 2015, which is the next chance to really work on global arrangements, the, the traditional way to do global arrangements is to do multilateral arrangements with huge numbers of countries in uh, binding agreements. And I think that. In Copenhagen, that led to basically a disaster. And I think when, we, when we're looking at Paris 2015 and ex thinking about what we're actually going to see, I think we're going to see a very different pattern. And I'm hoping that it will be one that has a lot more impact. I think we're going to see a lot more bilateral agreements where we're going to talk to the Chinese and come out together and talk together about the kinds of commitments we're going to make to change. And we're going to do that with other specific partners where we publicly and transparently talk about our goals and where we have to get to together and then have a, have a way of checking each other. But it's not going to be a binding treaty because I don't think we can get a binding treaty. So I think when, when I think about Paris 2015, I'm expecting 
that the Obama administration, along with some of the other big carbon emitting countries, are gonna take their responsibility really seriously and that we're gonna have real targets and they're gonna be significant and that that's gonna be a very significant step globally for us getting on the right track here. Because I think that we have the technology and more than that, we have the ingenuity going forward to solve these problems if we get the right you know, policy frameworks for industry to work within. Two, two questions. One, Tom, does that mean when you're, you're saying we can't get a binding treaty because we can't get a binding treaty through Congress? Votes. You can't get the votes. You can't get anything through Congress. So, and second, so what could we do to reverse some of this? Can, Jim, can I interrupt yeah, for yeah, one sure. second? I also want to say one thing about Steve Chu. The other thing that we really need, besides what he was talking about in terms of putting a price on carbon in one, frame, one policy or another, is we need more money for research. And that's something actually that the Department of Energy did under Secretary Chu's leadership, which was ARPA-E, which I think has been one of the most successful policies we had. I wish it were 10, I'm sure he does too. I wish it were 10 times bigger. I think that one of government's role is, basic re is supporting basic research because that's not something that companies can do. 10-year open-ended research projects that may come up with incredible stuff, that's not what companies do anymore. And, and I think that under his leadership, we did do that. I think the returns have been fantastic. And I think that's the kind of thing that has worked. That's where the internet started was DOD. That is a real government function and it's something that we, is really important right. and that we have to make sure we, we did do it in, in DOE and I think we need to do it a lot more. And that was the question I was gonna ask. So where does that go? Could you reverse some of this through the incredible scientific innovation that is the hallmark of well, right around here? Well, scientific innovation means you have better lower cost solutions uh, in many aspects of energy and sustainability. And, and, in term, and again, this is what I see as a nonpartisan issue. Yep. If I look at people, Republican, Democrat, you name it, undecided, Many, there is less debate on research uh, because companies are not gonna pay for that research. You want the entrepreneurial spirit to pick up the basis of their research, turn it into a business, turn it into something that gets out there. Uh, we had, in terms of RPE, um, uh, Fred Smith, who is the founder, CEO, and chair of FedEx, FedEx. Uh, a very prominent uh, Republican donor, and the last RPE conference I attended, he got up and said in front of 3,000 people, RPE was the best government program he has ever seen. Not the best government research program, the best government program, dollar for dollar, pound for pound. That was a, an acknowledged big donor Republican who said that. And, and there are a lot of other Republicans who feel that. And so this is something, again, where this is a legitimate, no, there's no disagreement that taxpayer money should be paying for basic research that will lead to these solutions. And the lit, and, and you know, as it goes into demonstration and deployment, the private sector should be picking this up. Uh, but, but no one's going to be investing five and 10 years into the new battery that will revolutionize transportation uh, until it's ready for that five year, you know, not 15 years. And, and it goes to carbon capture, it goes to lots of other things. Uh, we funded research in making better power transistors so you can transport electricity at high voltage much more cheaply. What do you start with? We started with high purity gallium nitride, okay? This is a little bit far away from, oh, I'm gonna turn this into a business. Uh, and, and, um, and, and, and higher purity silicon carbide. And, but within a couple of years, it, it leaked in and, and we're seeing much better power electronics for everything having to do with energy and the distribution generation of energy. So this is something which uh, is something I think all people should agree, this, this is a legitimate, uh, role of the government, and it, it pays for itself many and times And can over. you reverse climate change? Some of the trends? Could you actually reverse some of them? Well, uh, okay. Now we're going to another thing I think you wanted to talk about. And, and so we have damage done. We're going to continue to emit carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the coming decades. We have to curb that, and then we have to eventually curb it, not only curb the increase, but really have to, by mid-century, get it down to 
20% of what we're doing today globally. That's the target. Now, we may not get there quite candidly. So what do we need to do? So, so there is, if we go over 500, 500 parts per million carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, we're going to very uncomfortable territory for anybody who's really looked at the climate models. Okay. So, so what are we going to do? Well, I think we start with, so let me use the word geoengineering and start with the more benign forms of geoengineering. Reforestation is geoengineering, just as deforestation was geoengineering. More sustainable agriculture is geoengineering. Those things can have a profound impact on carbon emission and mineralization of carbon, which is what we need. We need to use the sun and, and the biosphere to mineralize it so it doesn't just go on the tree, the tree falls down and gets recycled. It actually has to be driven into mineralization. And we need to do this. And then that's where research can help a lot. Research and change our agricultural practices so we actually start to mineralize. You know, there's a min minor part of mineralization of carbon, which actually led to a lot of things, including fossil fuel. <laughs> over <laughs> tens of millions of years. <laughs> and so we need to accelerate that because I think we will shoot over the danger point, and that carbon is going to stay in the atmosphere for a millennia. But I'd, I'd make two points. One is, don't forget, this is cumulative. So it's as if we were standing in a big vat that went over our head, and the water was going up. The fact that the water goes up slower when it gets up to around our mouth or our nose doesn't mean we can breathe. If it's still going up, it's going to get to a place that is extraordinarily uncomfortable for us. So at some point, we actually have to have the water stop going up and start to recede. Right. So that's, it's cumulative. So when we think about this, we actually have to get to a place where we're not emitting carbon. And the natural response of the Earth when you have more carbon dioxide, there's more plant life, and there is some mineralization. But that's the thousand-year cure. Okay, you don't want to wait a thousand years because you might have drowned by then. But the other thing <laughs> that I would say to you guys is this: when we've actually turned our attention to these kind of significant engineering slash pollution problems, we've solved them faster, cheaper, and more effectively than anyone ever predicted. We really have, and it's been big companies like DuPont that have come up with stuff where they go like, wow, this would be terrific, and little companies, but there is an amazing amount of American ingenuity that if we give them a straightforward sim signal that you're gonna make a ton of money if you do this, and you're gonna be a hero if you do this, they're gonna be, there is going to be a Thomas Edison out there. There is going to be a DuPont who come up with things that blow our mind. And, we, and then we assume they were always there. Everyone always assumes the internet has always been here. It hasn't. <laughs> we now know that Facebook was, has been here since 1700. It hasn't. <laughs> And that's what's going to happen in energy. We're going to be looking there going like, it's always been this way. No, that's three months. Yeah, but yeah. This, this invites, it seems to me, a conversation about uh, not simply the mechanisms at our disposal for what we can call geoengineering, human interventions in a way that affect the climate in, in very deliberate and intentional ways. Uh, agriculture is one. But, but there are also um, ethical questions about what many people now consider to be, I think, rather drastic measures. Um, in, human interventions that would, would, with some high degree of certainty, reduce the temperature of the, of the Earth. And uh, I don't know enough about the science to give you any detail about this. Perhaps y y you do. Uh, when I hear you say that agriculture is a form of geoengineering, do you also mean to to sort of swat away ethical concerns about more drastic things. I mean, imagine a future where we go past 550 parts per million, and instead of spending Tom Steyer's money on political interventions, you can buy the climate science to engineer the climate, and um, you just unilaterally go off and do it on your own. Well, OK, so, so uh, let me remind people again that geo agriculture was the major geoengineering event of the last couple of centuries. If you look at the land on, in the world that's not, that's not mountains, that's not desert. A lot of it is under agriculture or range production, or grazing land, okay? It's a large fraction of the land. Uh, that is 
that in itself is a major geoengineering problem. The other things, for example, putting lots of sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere, I think has, could have large and unintended consequences. It does a little cooling, but it, it's an, it, it, is, it doesn't change the fundamental problem of the carbon dioxide. It adds to the acidification problem uh, of the ocean, which has been uh, more acid by, where I'm not gonna do pH, I'll do it in percentage, 30% more acidic ocean today than before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is not, these are not small effects. And, and so you stick up under sulfur dioxide, guess what? You, you're gonna have acidification. And, and so I think we, that, things like that, we have to go very, very slowly and gingerly. The other things, like reforestation, we can, we can go fast. Just, that's geoengineering, that's a big deal. But, but let me please also address your question, Rob, because you're making the assumption, it seems to me in your question, that these things will have changed, but will still be in the same world but actually we won't. By the time we get to 550 parts per million, we will be in a completely different world. And I'm not talking about the fact, you know, people think, oh, it'll be a little warmer. No, we'll be in a different political world. You know, if you look at, if you read what's happened in Syria, a lot of that had to do with a drought. The impacts on how people live, on people needing to move, in terms of people being, their lives being threatened around the world, the, the number of people whose lives and children's lives will be threatened by this will be enormous. So once we get there, we're not gonna be sitting here politely discussing, you know, gee, is it time to talk about a carbon tax? We will be in major crisis mode. And, and, we and will so be, and the, we will, all this stuff will be, that's what we're right. trying to avoid, having that conversation. And we will need research to scarf that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. You've, you've, you just, think of water pollution. You wanna control its source, that's the cheapest. You've dumped it into the rivers and the lakes and the oceans. It becomes much more expensive to clean it up. Yeah. But, uh, but in the end, we're gonna have to do that too. And so, and that's research and development. It's really research. We, we've reached our closing time, I'm afraid. But, uh, and we've only scratched the surface of this very complicated Correct. subject. So I'd just like to uh, alert you to something that on November 13th, uh, there will be a conference uh, in the uh, Gun Building, not far from here, jointly sponsored by the Bill Lane Center for the American West and the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. It's the, called the, formally the fourth annual State of the West Symposium. And our agenda on that day is going to be regional consequences or responses to California's environmental leadership, especially AB 32. Uh, our inaugural speaker in, at lunchtime is uh, Nariana Kosher Lakota, who's the chair or president of the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Minneapolis, in whose district, among other things, is the Bakken Shale. Uh, and our closing speaker in the evening is the sitting head of the Western Governors Association, the governor of Nevada, Brian Sandoval. We'll have panel discussions through the afternoon, especially focused on infrastructure, especially water transport and energy transport in the region. The conference as it happens is by invitation only, but I happen to know there are some places available. There's no fee for it. And if you're interested, please go to the website of the Bill Lane Center, just Google West Stanford, and it'll take you there and signify that you'd like to attend and we'll try to accommodate you. But until then, I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, the program tonight. Hold on, T T Tom has asked for one last word. Can I just ask you guys to please vote on November 4th? <laughs> because this is our great democratic tradition and we should participate in this Particularly all the citizens. students out there. Here, here. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.